Hi everybody, it's Rich Formidoni from Korg. We're back here in the uh, control room at Korg USA, and thank you very much for joining us. We see we uh, we got a bunch of people already logged in. Thanks for your patience. So, um, as you have questions, please shout them out. Uh, we've got our product support team here, uh, and they'll be uh, filtering some questions to me as I walk you through some some goodies on the Kronos. So one of the things I wanted to start off today uh, and do for you is to show you how to make a combi. So one of the first things that a lot of people want to do when they get a Kronos or any other workstation keyboard that might be multi timbral like this is to uh, learn how to create splits and layers. And that's when you want to be in combi mode. So what I'm going to do here is quickly switch to uh, another view. This is a deluxe multi-cam setup that we got here. Oop. Got to make the other camera available real quick. We'll work on that. Um, anyway, in combi mode on the Kronos, I can tell you, tell you while this is happening, the uh, uh, a combi can play up to 16 different timbres at once. So as you go through programs, you'll hear a wide variety of different sounds using the nine synthesis engines. And then in a combi, you can combine 16 of them. And each program can actually host two different synth engines at the same time, which is very cool. So uh, I'll play an example of some of the combis here. This is the first one you hear when you start the Kronos. stuff happening there with drum tracks and uh, and karma firing off all kinds of accompaniment so um, I'll play another one of my favorites here we have lots of orchestral combis that give you really a complete orchestra and different configurations that you can play with <laughs> And this particular combi actually shows off something that's, uh, that's very cool. Not only can you split the sounds based on where they are on the keyboard, you can actually split them based on velocity. So down here, oh good, we've got our other camera up. So here we go, this is the, uh, oops, and we're off again. <laughs> Bear with us while we uh, iron out some little technical difficulties here. Um, what I was explaining was, down here in the left hand, I've got some lower instruments, and if I really hit it hard, I get that timpani. Now up top, I've got some strings and woodwinds, and if I really hit it hard, I get the brass. How are we doing on that other camera? Up yet? There we go. All right, looking good. So what I'm going to do is jump to an empty combi. I've just gone to a user bank D here, and uh, we've got an init combi. Any Anytime you start a combi from scratch, you'll see init combi right there. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to layer uh, piano and strings. That's a very, very uh, popular uh, combi that people want to create. It's a very uh, often used layer. So now, by default, all 16 of these timbres are set to the Kron uh, Kronos German Grand Piano. I'm going to leave the first one as is, and the second one, just by touching this little category box here, I can select from categories of sounds. Now I'm going to touch the strings category, and just select the first one, Legato Stereo Strings. I still only hear the piano. That's because I have to do one more step here, and that's go to Timbre Parameter, and change the MIDI channel of timbre 2, which is the string sound I just called up, and I just uh, turn that down to 01G. And by the way, you can select that value using the slider here, using the increment decrement buttons, using the dial, or type 1 and hit enter on the number pad. So now, let's say I want to adjust the mix a little bit. Go back to my 
broad sweeping view here. Now over here on the left side, we've got this control panel, which uh, as you may know if you've seen some other videos or if you've gotten to play with Kronos, you can have in several different modes. Right now it's in timbre slash track mode. And what that allows us to do is use the control surface like a mixer. So my first two channels right here are actually uh, allowing me to control the two different sounds that I'm working with. Are you, are you on the faders here? Do I switch cameras? I will leave it as is, cool. All right, so we've got them both cranked up to, uh, to the top level here. Now I'm gonna lower the level of the strings. I could go in reverse if I want to have a stronger string sound with a little bit of percussive attack from the piano. So that's not a heck of a lot of work to get a very nice blend of sounds. Now let's take it a step further and do a split. So I'm going to uh, set the piano and strings that I just made here to the top half of the keyboard and the bottom half I'll set to be an acoustic bass. And I'll switch back to the close up view and show you how that's done. Through the magic of technology we have both views at once. All right. So now I'm going to jump back into the timbre parameter view and I'm going to set a third timbre to 01G, just like I did the first two. So now, just to point out here, we're in the timbre parameter tab, in the MIDI tab above that, and I've set the first three timbres all to 01G. Now I'm gonna push the exit button that's right over here next to the display. And now, we're back to where I selected the sounds. So I left the piano as is, I chose some strings. Now, for the third program, I'm gonna to touch and select a bass. And we'll go with an acoustic bass. Now I have all three sounds playing at the same time all across the key bit. The next step, after I touch OK, is to set zones. There's a tab right here at the bottom that says MIDI filter slash zones. So I'm going to touch that and we'll go to keyboard zones. Now, if you can see here, each one of the timbre, <clears throat> excuse me, each one of the timbres has four different parameters that I can modify. The top key, top slope, bottom slope, and bottom key. Right now, we're only concerned with the top key and the bottom key. So, for the first two sounds, I want to set to the top half of the keyboard as I described. All I have to change is the bottom key. So, what I'm going to do is highlight the bottom key for the first timbre, hold down the enter button, and play middle C. Now I'll do the same thing for that second timbre. Touch the bottom key. All right, so now when I play below middle C, I get just the bass. Up top, I still have the bass. So now I have to limit the third timbre to stop at middle C. So looking back at the screen here, now on the third timbre, I want to look at the top key. So instead of G9, which is all the way off the end of the keyboard here, I'm going to hold down the Enter button and push the B that is just below middle C. So there you have it. That's a quick and easy way to do splits and layers. So uh, Max, any questions coming through? Not so far. All right, folks, anytime you feel the need to ask a question, just fire it right off. We'll, uh, we'll get to them as we can. Um, as long as we're here, this is a great time to talk about some effects and the way that they can be used in combis. So we touched on effects a little bit in the last uh, webcast that we did, and I just want to show you some of the ways that you can use them, say within the, the confines of this combi that we're working with. So I'm going to touch the IFX tab, and here we see our 12 insert effects. And down at the bottom, we see all 16 of the timbres that are in the combi. So let's say that I wanted to add a little bit of chorus to the strings. So I'm going to set the output of the strings, which is right there. It's currently set to left slash right. I called it the output. It's actually called the bus select. And what I'm going to do 
is change that to IFX1. So now you can see a line coming from timbre 2 up to the first slot in the insert effects rack. The next thing I do is touch insert effects. Now here is where I can choose what the 12 effects are that go in that insert effects rack. So I'm going to turn the first effect on, touch the uh, category search that's right next to that, and I'm going to go to the chorus uh, flanger phaser category. All right, I've selected chorus, and it's turned on. So now we've got a very, uh, a very subtle chorus sound coming through on the strings. Now, let's take a look at the bass. Sounds like that could benefit from a little bit of reverb. But, as you may know, when you start mixing together a lot of instruments, reverb is something that you might use for a lot of them. Really, choruses too. But for this example, let's use reverb. Uh, if you're using an effect where you know you're going to reuse it on many different instruments, you can use it as a master effect. So that lets you apply varying amounts of the effect uh, for each timbre. Now I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to jump over to the Master Effects tab. Here we see two stereo master effects and two stereo total effects. I'm going to turn on the first master effect, and right next to that little arrow I can choose a category here. Here is Reverb, and we're going to go with Overb, which is a fantastic sounding reverb and there is a return that is assigned to the master effects slot that I just selected. So I'm going to go ahead and crank that up. Now we don't hear it yet because we have to do another step. Back to the IFX tab. Now, remember these routings where I showed you how to uh, do the bus select and select insert effect one for the strings there? Below those selections are two three-digit numbers. They're all set to triple zero right now. Those stand for, those are for Master Effects 1 and Master Effect 2. Now the first thing that I want to do is apply some reverb to the bass. So I'm going to touch the triple zeros for Master Effect 1 on timbre 3. So now we've got some reverb on the bass. If I want some for the piano, I don't have to go back and select another effect. I can just touch the triple zero on timbre one. So now there's a little bit of reverb on the piano as well. Now if you notice, the two triple zeros on timbre two are grayed out. I can't set a master effect for timbre two right now. That is because we have already taken the output of timbre two and sent it to one of the effects. After it goes through that first effect slot, it goes out. There's an output of that effect. And what we're going to do right now is go to the IFX 1 through 12, excuse me, the Insert Effects tab, and here we can see the output of the effects, and we can route it further from that point. So here's Insert Effect 1, which is the stereo chorus. That's where I've got the strings going. And if I look over to the right, I see Send 1 and Send 2. So all I have to do is touch the triple zero next to Send 1. So now I've got reverb. The reason that we do it like this is because if I go back to the routing tab, I can send more than one timbre to an individual effect slot. So for example, if I wanted the piano to also be sent to that chorus that I selected for the strings, I can do that. So now there's lines from timbres 1 and 2, and they're both going into the insert effects. So if you think of this in a real world, uh, uh, a parallel to a physical application, it's like each of these 12 insert effects has a nearly unlimited uh, number of inputs and then all of those inputs get summed together and then you go from the output to the master effects. So let's take a look at one of the combis that is preset within Kronos. We'll check out the one I was just playing. 
if you go to the IFX tab, you can see some pretty complex routing going on here. So timbre 1 is going to insert effect 6. Many of the other timbres are going to insert effect 1, as well as other timbres. And then you can see that there is chaining happening. So over here on the right side, there are some effects that are connected to others via virtual chain. If I jump to the IFX uh, insert effects tab here, I can see how that's done. So insert effect one here, you can see it follows a path down to insert effect five. So it's, it's very much like having a really flexible patch bay full of effects that, uh, that you can use for whatever purpose you want. Now, just to let you know here, uh, the difference between master effects and total effects. As I said before, master effects operate on a send basis. So you can uh, have varying amounts of each effect uh, on each timbre. The total effects, however, are always on and applied to the entire sound. So that means they're very good for um, reacting to a room. If you've got your Kronos in a specific type of environment, uh, you can actually have that preset, say for example, an EQ right here. This, this particular one is set to a stereo master EQ and a mastering limiter. So that could be good for uh, uh, tuning to a specific room or a venue where you might have your Kronos. So let me switch back here. So have we, uh, have we gotten any questions coming in? We have one question from India. Um, All right. Uh, we'd like to know how many voices can be linked to one bus without getting latency or overloading the processor. Ah, well, uh, the answer is you will never run into that problem. Latency uh, within the Kronos does not get affected by how many voices you pump into it. So it's very similar to an analog signal chain. Uh, the, the way the effects are structured, you can run as many timbres as you want without noticing any latency. Now, in terms of the processor, I don't have an exact number for you, but uh, I'm just going to scoot back to the close-up view for just a second here. Um, there is a perf meters tab, which I touched on very briefly in our first webcast. And you can see here, I just turned the volume down. There is a voice CPU and an effects CPU meter. So you can see exactly how much power is being used. You have to work extremely hard to peg those meters. Now, the only real way that you can do that is if you're using, basically if you're using a routing that could make sense a different way. For example, uh, the overb that I was using is a very processor intensive effect, um, but it's also one that you would use as a master effect. If you had 16 overbs running at once, you'd, you'd run into a problem. But if you used it the way I just described on a master effect, then you'll have no issues whatsoever. So uh, I hope that answered your question. Any, any others coming in? All right. So another thing I wanted to show you was uh, a few basic sequencing tasks. Uh, a lot of you love to sequence in the, uh, in the Kronos. It's got one of the best sequencers ever to appear in a keyboard. Uh, those of you that are familiar with the Triton, the M3, especially the Oasis, will be able to get around the Kronos sequencer uh, with ease because the functionality is very, very similar. So let me jump back to the close-up view. All right. So this is the play record tab in our sequencer. Here we can see 16 different tracks. Excuse me one second. got to grab a drink of water. All right. So very similar to a combi, you see there are faders for each, uh, for each track. There's a pan control for each track. There's also play, mute, um, uh, play and mute buttons here. And you can actually control those using the control surface on the left side. Anytime you see physical faders, they can be controlled by using the actual physical faders on the side of the Kronos. So to get started, you select a sound for track one. You do that the same way I chose timbres in combis. You touch this little category search button right here. And I'm going to go to, say, a drum kit. Touch OK. Turn the volume back up. And you can record something like that. Before I start recording, I'm going to set my record resolution. This is also known as input quantize. So here you can actually correct your timing before you even play. So I'm going to set my resolution to 16th notes and push the record right button. I'll drop the tempo down a little bit 
And I did that with the tap tempo button just below the tempo knob. So I got a pretty simple beat there. Alright, um, and as you can see it corrected my timing so the notes line up to a grid. The next thing we want to learn how to do is change tracks so we can focus on the next track. Now just under the name of the song, which is right here, I can see track 01, MIDI track 01. I'm going to touch that, oops, excuse me, touch that and push the increment button, increment, same as up, and now we're on MIDI track 2 accidentally switch tabs there. So now I get to choose a sound for track two and record it. Right now it's on the piano. Touch the category button. I'm going to select the bass category. And there's lots of cool bass sounds to choose from. That particular sound is using the STR1 physical modeling engine. It's a really, really good bass. So I'm going to keep my record resolution at 16th notes. All right. And I just did a quick recording there. Next, we switch to track three, select a new sound. I'm going to select an electric piano. Let's use Herbie's Butterfly EP, one of my favorites. Press record right, and then start stop, and we're recording. Now I left a little bit of space in there. Let's say I wanted to fill that space on the same track, but keep what I've done already. I'm going to head over to the Preferences tab, and instead of uh, Overwrite, I'm going to switch to Overdub. So when you have Overwrite selected and you record over what you've done, it'll erase what you had previously. When you have Overdub selected, it'll allow you to record over top of what you've already got. All right, locate, record right. Start, stop. Got my two measure count in. All right, so now I've got all the, uh, all the different electric piano sounds that I recorded all together. Let's say I didn't like what I just recorded and I wanted to do something different. Compare is your friend here. If you push the compare button, it undoes the last recording operation that you did. So you have the opportunity to redo it. Record right, start stop, and I'm going to do something different. I've got something with a slightly different flavor there. Now, one important thing to note, as you're sequencing, uh, the sounds come into sequence mode with no effects built in, except uh, a, good, a good exception there is that electric piano sound where the effect is part of the synthesis engine. So if you would like to copy all the effects that you hear in program mode, I'll show you how to do that. First, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Let's go to that acoustic bass sound back in program mode. We were at, oh, I'm sorry, deep finger bass is where we were. All right, if I go to my insert effects, I see that there's chorus, EQ, and a compressor on that bass. Now, if I switch to sequence mode and go back to track two, the effects are gone. Fortunately, we've included a shortcut to bring the effects in. First, I'll explain why the effects are gone. Uh, in program and combi mode, 
you have those 12 insert effect slots that I mentioned earlier. In sequence mode, you have the same 12 insert uh, effect slots. So basically, when you're using a single sound, we don't want to limit you from using every single available effect. Uh, when you're in sequence mode, however, you need to share the effects. So, this is very cool. Touch the drop down menu from within sequencer mode and select copy from program. Now, if you notice, deep finger bass is already selected. I'm going to touch IFX all used. And now I'm going to touch, oops, make sure we've got the right MIDI track selected. The bass is on track two. And I'll touch OK. Now, the effects have been copied over. <clears throat> So now we've got the same effects, but there's a cool thing that you can do in case you need to copy another program in or another program's effects. You can actually uh, uh, append them on the list that, uh, that already exists. So for example, in the, uh, in the M3 and previous workstations, uh, not including the Oasis, when you use that copy from program command more than once, it would overwrite the effects that you just brought in. But let's go to that drum kit I believe that was the Studio Standard Kit. All right. Now if we go to the Insert Effects, we've got some more stuff there. Say we want to copy those effects in. Back to the song we go. Timbre 1, Copy from Program, Studio Standard Kit. IFX All Used. That's the one you want. Select Timbre 1, Touch OK. Now, we have all the effects turned on and ready to rock. Now, keep in mind, this doesn't copy the master effects. So, for example, on the bass, we still have the limiter, the compressor, but the reverb was not copied over. So, uh, that's because when I chose copy from program, I didn't select the MFX or TFX. So, just to let you know, we do have some great shortcuts in place. Uh, that'll let you copy these effects in and make sure your sounds are exactly the way they were in program and combi mode. How are we doing over there? We have a couple of questions. All right, hit um, me. We have uh, Jim wanted to know if the faders will automate on screen. The faders will automate? Oh, as in do you, do you physically see them move on the screen? The physical faders themselves do not move, but when you are in sequencer mode and you're looking at this mixer here, Yes, you will see the move on the screen as you record. Now, this brings up an interesting point. When you record fader movements, this is a great thing to be cautious of. Um, there are a couple of best practices that can really help you out. When you're recording automation, make sure you have the track selected that you want to automate. Because whatever track is selected right here, if you move all these faders, those fader movements will be recorded on that specific track that's selected. So, just to help keep things orderly, that's that's a good uh, a good thing to remember. Got another one? Yep. Mark from Belgium wants to know: Is there a swing quantize option, or can you, for instance, copy velocities from another track? Yes. Uh, the swing quantize option I can definitely show you. Um, all right. So back in the sequence mode, we go track edit, and here we can see a visual represent representation of what we've recorded. Now everything here is already quantized, so we'll do what you said and add some swing to it. So go to the drop down menu, and we are going to go to quantize. Now here we have some options from measure what to measure what. Let's just say measure 11. And uh, here we can set the amount of swing. So let's say we wanted 25%. Touch OK. And it's important to note that just uh, quantized track two. So let's go to track one and repeat the procedure. Now I just selected quantize again, and it already has the values that I chose before. So 25%, switch to track three, quantize 25%. <laughs> so there is your, uh, your quantize. Got another one? Um, well, we have a few other questions, uh, not related to the sequencer so much. No problem. Whatever your question is, that's why I'm here. It doesn't have to be related to what I'm talking about. Uh, ask away. 
Okay. We had a question. That's a dangerous thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> we had a question about wave sequencing. Uh, what does it mean? How can you use it? Can you show us a, a demo? Yes, absolutely. Wave sequencing was first introduced on the Wave Station, which is a hugely popular synthesizer, incredibly powerful, and a lot of fun to use. A wave sequence is essentially a list of waveforms, and the Kronos, or the Wave Station, would cycle from one to the next. And it could do this in a smooth manner, cross-fading from one to the next, or it could jump quickly from one to another. So here's a quick example. So let's jump to a couple others here. In bank user A, there are a couple of really good wave sequences. And I will just scroll through them here. Now also, wave sequencing is tied to the vector joystick in some unique ways. Um, vector synthesis is something else that, uh, uh, that was a very powerful feature on the wave station. And um, it allows you to adjust the way the waveforms are selected and which ones are getting played. So as I play, if I move it all the way to the right side here, I've got a different selection than on the left side. And a happy balance in the middle. Now, I see we're zoomed in on there. I'm going to go to global mode and touch the wave sequence tab. So here, we can actually uh, select parameters for wave sequences. I'm going to go to step parameter, and this is where you actually see the list of waveforms. So for each one of these, I can select if it's a, uh, a, a sample or a rest or a tie, then what kind of sample it's being used. And this is really neat. This can be either a, a ROM sample, a RAM sample, something that you have recorded in yourself, your own samples. Uh, or it can be something from our EXS libraries, and those are the libraries that play back directly from our, uh, from our internal drive. So you can actually make a list that combines your own samples with the samples that are built into Kronos. So taking that a step further, you can reverse the samples, you can adjust the velocity, the level for each one, the duration, crossfade values. So you, you end up with some really, really unique timbres. I'll give you some more. <laughs> So these are examples of rhythmic uh, wave sequencing. Let's see if we can find you a nice, uh, a nice smooth, evocative one. I'm coming up on a lot of rhythmic ones here. But if I go back to global mode, wave sequence, here we can select the actual sequences right from here. Orchestra band hits. There's an example of a smooth crossfade that goes from one sound to another. Belmore. So wave sequencing has a lot of soundtrack potential. In fact, uh, when the wave station first came out, you would see a lot of, a lot of film scoring guys uh, calling up a sound on the wave station, getting something heavy, putting it on a key, pushing record on whatever they were using, go and have lunch, come back and chop up what they wanted to use and put it in the film. So all of that technology is also built into Kronos. Hope that answers that. Uh, we got another one? Yeah, we have some uh, <clears throat> sampling questions, uh, again, from India. Uh, basically, uh, someone wants to know if they're sampling sound data from, let's say, a, a computer, uh, Omnisphere, or some other similar plugin, uh, and they want to blend it with Chrono Sound so they can kind of create a combi of them. Um, they want to know how do they save these samples to Chrono so that they don't have uh -huh. to carry around the flash drive everywhere they go. Sure. Uh, 
Secondly, uh, is it possible to sample sounds into one program with different sounds as per the velocity? In other words, uh, have different velocity switching? Yes to everything. All right, zooming back in. So let's say that you've recorded some sounds using the built-in sampler. You go to sampling mode and uh, uh, using this, you record some sounds coming out from your computer. By the way, you can do that using USB. So all you need to do is go to audio input and uh, here are the two USB inputs. You can actually record audio coming out from your computer without having to hook up analog audio cables. So that's a very cool thing. Then you record the sample. The next thing you want to do after you do the recording is convert multi-sample to program. And what that will let you do is create a program that resides in program mode with all the other sounds that are in Kronos, uh, apart from commies, of course. So then you can actually call the sound back up and use it in a combi as I described earlier. And that combi can be set to switch programs based on velocity or based on keyboard zones. So one important thing you asked was how to save those sounds. I'm going to jump over to disk mode. Now let's say you have your flash drive plugged into the back, your USB drive. Uh, in drive select here, you would have another option. You would have uh, the USB drive would appear there in addition to the hard drive. So because you've sampled the sounds into the Kronos, they reside in RAM. They're currently in the RAM memory that's in Kronos, so you don't have to drag them off of that drive again. So once they're in the sampler, all you have to do is go to the Save tab. Next, touch the drop-down menu in the upper right-hand corner, and you have a couple of options here. Because you saved, uh, because you created a program or a series of programs along with the sampling data, what I would recommend you do is, uh, well, the easiest thing to do is, is select Save All, but you can save sampling data, and uh, it'll result in what's called a KSC file. So that's going to contain all the, uh, the multi-sample data that that particular program will need. And you have some options here. You can save only the single multi-sample that you recorded, uh, all multi-samples, or all samples in total. And then after you've done that, uh, you can save the program within Kronos. And if you want to, you can save a PCG file as a backup of all the different sounds that you've got. Uh, but that program will be able to reference that KSC file. So every time you turn the Kronos on, well, previous to Kronos and uh, uh, very few keyboards will let you do this here, uh, you would have to load that KSC file uh, every time you turn the keyboard on. But if I go to global mode, I have an option for KSC auto load. Now this lets me select sample files that I want Kronos to load every time it starts up. At the moment, it's loading preload.ksc. And that's out of the box the way Kronos works. So this will have all the, uh, uh, all the sample data for the German grand piano, the uh, Japanese grand piano, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it doesn't leave you with a heck of a lot of RAM left. So once you start digging into Kronos and customizing the sounds, you may want to uncheck the preload and customize it. Pick and choose the sounds that you want, and you can add your own KSC file with the Add KSC button right there. So right from here, I would choose the KSC file that I just saved on the hard drive, and uh, then touch Add, and then it would be loaded every time I turn on the Kronos. All right, what's next? Uh, this is actually a really good one. Uh, the WaveStation AD... Well, don't give me one that's going to stump me. <laughs> this might. <laughs> the WaveStation AD had a vocoder built in. Ah. Can you use a wave sequence to modulate your own voice with the Kronos? Yes, you absolutely can. You can route uh, just about anything to be a, a, a carrier source for the vocoder effect. Um, and the reason for that is because the vocoder lives in the effects processing area of Kronos. It's an insert effect. So all you would have to do is um, take that particular wave sequence and assign it to the vocoder effect, as we were doing earlier. And then um, in the audio tab, I'll show you how to do this here, uncheck the use global setting. Say you're plugged into input one. Set the FX control bus to one. And then let's say you got your vocoder plugged in. I don't have a microphone plugged in here, so unfortunately I can't show you. But uh, once you call up the vocoder effect, you will be able to, and now I've got to find the vocoder effect, of course. Other than, there we go, vocoder. 
touch OK. Jump into the vocoder effect, and here's your source, FX Control 1. So input 1 is being routed to FX Control 1, and it's being listened to here. That's going to be the modulator. And in the IFX routing, you can see that uh, insert effect 1 is going to be the carrier. And that can be just about any sound. So the answer is yes. OK. Uh, let's see. We have a few more questions here. Uh, someone wants to know, is, is there any way to redirect a wave sequence from HD1 uh, to, let's say, mod 7 instead uh, of using raw PCM oscillators, like what would be found in uh, HD1, if I'm understanding the question correctly? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a little tough to understand. You can't, maybe I'm understanding this wrong, uh, mod 7 can't be used as part of a wave sequence, but... Uh, I'm sorry, read, read that to me one more time. Is there any way to redirect the wave sequence from HD1 to Mod 7, for example, instead of using raw PCM oscillators found there? Oh, okay. I think I understand what he means. Uh, he or she, sorry. So let's go to Mod 7. Uh, I believe what you're talking about is this section right here where I can choose uh, a PCM oscillator. So you have the option of selecting a multi-sample, but you can't unfortunately select a wave sequence. And the reason for that is, if we go back to a wave sequence and modify each step, you're selecting the same raw material for each part of a wave sequence that you are in that one uh, oscillator for mod 7. So it can take one sample, one multi-sample, but unfortunately not a complete wave sequence. That being said, you could use something like the vocoder effect uh, in conjunction with the effects control buses to modify what's happening uh, uh, with mod 7. But you wouldn't actually be able to do the FM style modulation using a wave sequence. Okay, let's see. Okay, uh, Gil would like to know, is there a combi that feels like you were strumming a real acoustic guitar? Hmm, yes, there is. It's a really good one, as a matter of fact. All right. Feels like strumming is the key to, to what I was just asked. I'm going to go to the guitar combis, and what I'm looking for is gentle guitar. I'm going to turn Karma on. Camera doesn't quite pick it up, but there's a ribbon control on the, uh, on the left side. <laughs> if you play the chord correctly, strum on the ribbon, and here, let me jump over to our, is it possible to catch the ribbon? There we go. All right. So yes, you can definitely strum. Um, there's another way to accomplish this, and I'll show you what I mean. Uh, jump back to scene three here. Uh, I'm going to do it using Karma. So I'm going to switch to program mode and we'll call up, uh, he said you'd like a steel string guitar. So I'm going to go to the guitar category and six steel strings. And this again is using the STR1 pluck string physical modeling engine. Now let's turn Karma on. Now, if you listen closely, you can actually hear the strings being strummed in the correct order. So it's automating that for you. Karma's doing that. Um, so let's say we wanted to tweak that a little bit. Um, we don't have to do a heck of a lot to do that. I'm going to touch the control surface tab switch to the dual camera view here. All right, touch control surface, and now we have uh, identified what the left side of the keyboard is doing, what the control surface is up to. So I can see that these sliders are now controlling what Karma is up to. Now I'm gonna press a chord and have it hold it down. Now I can see that I have some parameters here, like duration control. So that's very similar to palm muting the strings as I strum. I also have one called Rhythm Swing, 
which is pretty obvious. And I have one called Rhythm Pattern. So I have continuous control over a huge variety of different patterns there. So uh, if I also wanted to switch to a completely different kind of strumming, I can go to the Karma GE tab, touch the category right there, strum one, two, three, four. You can see there's a whole category of strums that you can pick from, each of which is pretty much infinitely variable. And of course, you can apply this, uh, this particular Karma GE to any of the programs or combis that are in Kronos. Gil, uh, Gil's response was, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> Glad you liked it. Uh, next question. Can you demonstrate that nano pad right over there? You mean this? There you go. Next. All right. Uh, they, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just kidding. They'd like to know what you can, can control with it. This fancy little guy does all kinds of things. So uh, we touched on this very briefly. Um, yeah, that's, that's actually a good shot. Uh, we touched on this very briefly uh, in the last session. There are on-screen pads. So from this piano program, I can trigger eight different chords. As I move up and down on each one of these individual strips, it changes the velocity. Or if I have this nano pad hooked up via USB, I can trigger the chords like that. Note that this is very much the definition of plug and play. You literally plug the nano pad into one of the USB ports in Kronos and it just works. Um, that's also true of other USB controllers as well. It doesn't have to be a nano pad. Frankly, it doesn't even have to be a cord controller. Any USB class compliant MIDI controller will work. So uh, another good example, if you were to go to a drum kit, let's use the funk kit there. They're already mapped out, kick, snare, closed hat, hi-hat, tom, 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 crash. So you got some, uh, some useful stuff there. Uh, the other things you could do would be to hook up a MIDI keyboard via USB. So you could use a nano key or a micro key or a K-series controller or any other USB class compliant MIDI controller. If you have the weighted key Kronos, you could add a second manual that's great for synth parts with unweighted keys or vice versa. If you bought a 61 key Kronos and you have an 88 key MIDI controller, you could hook that up for uh, control of the piano sounds. All right. Okay. Uh, let's see. Can we use STR1 to simultaneously model several nuances on a violin? For example, playing non-vibrato, natural vibrato, pizzicato, etc. Uh, yes. Do I have a program built in that does exactly that? Give me a moment. <laughs> Let's go to my string section. And Rich, just before you get started, after this we have a customer who would like us to cover the step sequencing a little bit. Oh, sure. No problem. Um, hmm. We do have a lot of string sounds that can take advantage of STR1 to give you those nuances. Um, I'm going to show you one that doesn't use STR1. I'm going to show you one that's HD1 because those gestures that you mentioned are very specifically reminded me of this one program and I'm wondering if this would do what you want it to do. So right there, I went from legato to staccato, and then by hitting switch one, went right to pizzicato and back. 
So could you do this in STR1? Yes, there are many different ways you can, especially because you can incorporate samples into the mix with STR1. So you have control over how the string reacts uh, via vibrato. You can decide if, it, if the string moves in a linear fashion or if it's not quite linear. Or, um, and of course, vibrato can apply to either one of those instances. Pizzicato, you could absolutely shorten the duration. Um, you may find that a combination of samples and STR1 would give you the most natural response. Um, step sequencing. Yeah. Okay. So, look, just a few of the things that are on deck. Uh, after step sequencing, uh, we have some requests about octave switching on 61 key Pronos. Uh, yes. um, someone wants to hear some 80 synth sounds in there. Uh, <laughs> Top Gun, if you have anything like that. Ooh, Top and Gun. then uh, going over the different types of filter sounds in AL1. Cool. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, what was that first? Step sequencing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wee. All right. So let's go to a new song. There we go. All right. Oh, sorry. Let me zoom in on the screen. Now, what I have going here, just for narcissistic reasons, I'll make it so I can see myself. All right. I'm going to go to a new song and go to my drums. Actually, you know what? I'll do it with a bass line. Bass. There we go. Let's say, let's say I want to step sequence something like a, a 303 bass line. <laughs> because that's something that a lot of people would end up using a step sequencer for. So I'm going to go to Track Edit, then touch the drop-down menu, and here is MIDI Step Recording. Now right from this screen, I can, uh, I can enter my sequence just by playing the notes on the keyboard, and I can decide for each step uh, what the value is going to be, the note duration, the note velocity, and once I start playing, I'll see the list appear right there. All right, touch done. All right, let me jump back and everything. All right, yep. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna jump right back into that mode there. Okay, what I did was I played. Uh, 16th notes and it recorded quarter notes. So if I had selected 16th notes, it would have uh, it would have given me all the notes that I played in. Um, you can also select rests and tie if you want either a gap between notes or if you want the notes to glide into one another. So you heard me playing some some ties. They won't be recorded as part of a step sequence unless you first unless you first select tie or touch a step, oops, sorry, yeah, step back, there we go, uh, unless you decide to apply a tie to that particular step, <laughs> cranked up the tempo there, so yeah, you can do step sequencing with any of the built-in instruments, it doesn't have to be just bass, it could be drums, uh, it could be really anything, uh, what was next? 80s synth sounds. 80s Anything synth sounds. Top Gunnish in particular. Top Gunnish. Oh man, we channel Kenny Loggins, huh? Um, I'm gonna go to my fast synth sound. So you've got a lot of uh, the OB style brass sounds in here. Yeah. lots of those kind of things and really it's a huge variety of sounds that were very popular in the 80s we've got a ton of them covered here I'm just sort of going right to the brass sounds because they're uh, very popular digital synthesis FM style synthesis was also really really popular in the 80s and we've got some great examples of that um, probably the most popular one would be this guy. Now the FM style stuff is coming from Mod 7. So uh, as a matter of fact, if you have a, a DX synth, you can actually load your sounds from that synth into Mod 7 and it will read them. Very cool little side feature there. Um, 
Some other cool stuff, some bell sounds that were very popular in the 80s. And you can modulate them. Using the vector joystick. What was next? Uh, <laughs> AL1 filter sounds. How, how do they resonate? How but, do they resonate? Well, not how, but yes. Yeah, some examples. All right. Let's go to an AL1 synth sound. Let me find a good one for us here. That's sort of a arpeggiating kind of thing. Just want to find us a nice lead sound. Oh, I know what I'm looking for. Lead synth. Yeah. Bear with me one second. Just want to find us a good lead sound to play with. And maybe uh, afterwards, if you want to contrast that with the MS-20 filter or Poly-6 filter. Alrighty. All right. Talk amongst yourselves. Nope, not quite there. Hmm. Dead air, I know. Sorry, almost there. There's one specific one that I'm spending too much time looking for. Rather than look for it. <laughs> So that's an example of a filter using AL1. Now I'm going to jump into the filter tab here and show you a little bit of what's happening. This is a low pass filter and we can see the frequency is set to 31 and uh, it's also being modulated when I pull down the joystick. The resonance, excuse me, is being modulated when I move the joystick. Of course I can also use the knobs up top here. So let's crank up the resonance. I'm going to turn down the master volume here. So it can get very, very aggressive. And as you can tell, there are some uh, effects that we're running through here. We've got a uh, tube preamp modeling, which is adding some grit to that filter sound as well. So, but you can hear it accentuating certain frequencies. And there are other things that you can do if you don't want to do a low pass filter. You can select high pass or band pass, which I've just chosen here. I'll turn down the resonance. And the other cool thing about AL1 is that it actually has what's called a multi-filter. And this allows you to blend uh, varying amounts of different filter shapes. And I'll give you a good example of that. There's a sound in here that's called uh, almost there. It's another wonderful AL1 sound. There's obviously a lot of these, as you can tell. Oh, that would help. Technomix Control C2. All right, this is a very cool sound in AL1 because it uses the step sequencers, uh, it uses the filters in some very cool and unique ways. <laughs> Now, as I move the ribbon, it's going to cycle through uh, low pass and band pass filter shapes. So that's a pretty neat thing there. If I jump back to the filter tab, there's a multi filter tab where I can actually see the varying percentages of the filter shapes that are being used. Now, let's contrast that as you mentioned, with an MS-20 filter. The MS-20, uh, as you may know, has a very aggressive, uh, almost angry sounding filter when you want it to sound angry. 
So with this particular sound, if I pull the joystick down, I get a nice controlled uh, opening of the filter. If I touch the ribbon, madness. Now, if I crank up the resonance, I'll drop the volume a little bit. You can hear that the MS-20 filter actually self-oscillates, creates its own pitch. So uh, there's, there's a, a lot of variation between the different filters, and it's great that you have so many to choose from. All right, let's, uh, did I get all the ones in that in that last volley? <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, that last salvo. I think that covers a lot of it. All right, anything else uh, coming see. up? Uh, someone wants to know if they can convert sounds from FM7 and FM8 by native instruments. No, unfortunately you can't do that. You can do the DX synths, but uh, uh, we won't be able to read FM, uh, FM7 or FM8 sounds. Sorry about that. Okay, let's see. You may find that uh, Creating them from within Mod 7 is a is a heck of a lot of fun, though. There's there's a lot to do, and as a matter of fact, as long as we're on this panel here, I'll show you using this electric piano. Where did I put it? There it is. All right. This is Mod 7, and it's using the the electric piano sound that we heard before. So instead of uh, uh, you know, a two-line display or something like that where you have to uh, uh, pick your own algorithms or pick from six algorithms. Here you can actually create your own. So you have lots of fun things you can do with this style of synthesis that uh, you can't do on many others. Um, Another thing that's really neat that you can do is add wave shaping. And I don't want to get off on too much of a tangent here, but wave shaping is a big part of what makes Mod 7 so cool. So I've just enabled wave shaping, and now... can cycle through all these different types of wave shaper and you can see the uh, distortion that's being applied right there on the screen. So there's a lot to do and you can do that for any of the six VPM oscillators that are there. So it's definitely the deepest and, and most flexible engine in Kronos. Okay, uh, we've got a couple more questions. All right. Uh, Gil uh, wanted to know if you can use, let's say, a guitar mm -hmm. uh, to pro basically, can you connect it to a Kronos and process it? Oh, so in could you use like amp modeling to run an extra a guitar or any other absolutely, sound source? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, if you check out the last uh, live cast that we did, uh, I demonstrated how you'd be able to do this. But essentially, yes, you plug in a guitar, preferably through a preamp first to get the right uh, to get the right level, connect it to the audio input in the back, then route it right to the effects processors. As I mentioned before, it's very similar to an analog signal pad. So, yes, it's possible, and it sounds really good. Okay. I'm a little biased, but it sounds really good. <laughs> couple more questions. Um, we had a question if you could demo RPPR, and then after that, someone wanted to know if you could show the different percussion or drum options. So basically, you can not need a drummer. All right. Everyone's free. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> the drummer in my band is going to be furious with me. All right. Um, RPPR. Let's go to a new song. Sequence mode. And just type a song seven there. Now I'm going to select the parts that I want for this song. So the first thing I might use is a drum kit and uh, doesn't matter which one I use really but I'm gonna use one of our fancy EXS drum kits because I like them. There we go. And I'm just gonna record that real quick. Not that quick. Holy cow. Alright. And I'll do it using the nano pad. Finding my 
of sounds here. Ah, because I'm in sequence mode, the, uh, the mapping that was available to me in program mode, I would have to reset that. So rather than using the pads, I'm going to use the keys. All right, so uh, let me go into track edit and quantize that. We'll give it a swing value there. We'll set the resolution to 16th notes and see how well we did. Cool. All right. Now, I'm going to switch to pattern slash RPPR mode. I've got three tabs to work with. Pattern edit, pattern name, and RPPR setup. First thing I'm going to do is touch the drop down menu and select get from MIDI track. Sorry, that's the second thing I'm going to do. The first thing I'm going to do is show you that we currently have selected user pattern 00. That's the first pattern. Now, drop down menu, get from MIDI track. From song, I believe I'm on song 7, MIDI track 1, measure 1. All right, there's my pattern. It's looping that first measure endlessly. Now, I'm going to switch to user pattern 01, which is actually the second pattern. Now, drop down menu, get from MIDI track, song 7, MIDI track 1, but I'm going to do measure 4, touch OK. So now I have two rhythm patterns. I'm going to press exit and select some more timbres. For the second track, I'm going to call up, let's say, the Kronos German Grand. For the third track, I'll call up a bass. My basses are getting a lot of work out here. All right, back to pattern mode we go. Pattern edit. Instead of recording right into the main sequencer page, I'm just going to record right into RPPR now. I'm going to select user pattern 02, which is the third pattern. Now. I've also got to select the MIDI track. That's MIDI track 2. OK, so I'm just going to play a couple of chords. It's only going to be a measure long. Got my two bar count in there. All right, let's do another pattern of piano. Pattern 3. Okay, pattern four, switch to MIDI track three, which is my bass. Okay, pattern five, also the bass. Okay. So now I have six patterns total. Next, I'm going to assign them to keys on the keyboard so that when I press a key, I hear that pattern. That is done in the RPPR Setup tab. I'm skipping the Pattern Name tab for the sake of time, but here's where you can go in and name all the patterns that you just recorded. So RPPR Setup, Assign. So. C sharp 2 is my first drum pattern. D2, pattern 01. So now I've got the two drum patterns on keys that are adjacent to one another. Next, I'll assign the rest of them. Pattern 2, pattern 3, pattern 4, pattern 5. Assign them all and we'll select the appropriate MIDI tracks. So I'm holding down three keys. The drums, the piano, and the bass.
so you can vary the patterns up, play only the ones you want, and the rest of the keys are still working uh, on whatever track you have selected in sequencer mode. So that is RPPR, or real-time pattern play and record. So next question is, how do we fire your drummer? That's great. Um, <laughs> something coming up? Someone wanted to know if we could show off the uh, rather rare synthesizer behind you. Aha. Nope. Here's how to, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, what, what you're looking at, just real briefly here. Uh, over there is a PS3200. PS stands for Polyphonic Synthesizer, and that is the ultra-rare PS3300, which is essentially three PS3100s grafted together, and it's, it's a thing of beauty. But another story to be told another time. I do want to highlight some of the drum kits since, since uh, someone asked. I'm going to call up, let's, uh, let's get some of the, oh, here. This is a jazz ambient, jazz dry and ambient drum kit. And uh, this is one of the kits I was just using. Rather than me play it, I'm going to turn on Karma. And we can hear it do its thing. The neat thing about this particular drum kit and many other kits that uh, are in Kronos, um, you can actually vary the amount of room ambience. So here we've sampled the kit using microphones, and here we actually sampled the room using a different set of mics. I have control over those on sliders on the left side of the Kronos, so I can take in and out the room mics if I want. Or add it back in or take the kit mics out. And uh, that karma pattern that was being generated, you can modify the same way we did some of the strumming. So I'm gonna jump over to the control surface tab, start to beat up, and show you some of the things that I can do to it. Uh, adjust the amount of swing, obviously. I can actually uh, tell the drummer to improvise, give him some room to breathe. Or, of course, if I want a completely different rhythm and a different meter, Karma gives me tons and tons of things to choose from. Also, one other neat thing to know, any sound that I play in Kronos, uh, there will be a drum track that is assigned to it. Drum track is separate from Karma, and it basically gives you a quick shot of rhythmic accompaniment to, uh, to uh, uh, enhance whatever you're playing. So, for example, if I call up an electric piano sound, this is George Duke's uh, electric piano. We got to customize this with him, which was great. If I call it my drum track. So we've got a nice funky groove going there. Um, tons of drum kits built in, not just acoustic stuff. We've got a lot of the classic drum machines, a lot of very new and wild and inventive sounds. So there's really a huge vocabulary of percussion instruments to choose from, including instruments from all around the world. All right, got another one? Yeah, uh, someone wanted to know, how can you control it continuously, like a theremin, for example? Do you have that ability to control pitch in a continuous manner? Uh... The right answer is it depends. You can set um, hmm. you can set some synthesizers release value to be extremely long, and then using Karma you could re-trigger the note so that then you could be modifying it using the controllers. There are ways to do that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, if you were to hook up, let's say, a, a controller, uh, an, 88, an 88 key controller, mm -hmm. uh, how do the pedal assignments work? Uh, is it, you know, both speaking from the standpoint of the Kronos versus the controller, how do they carry between both? 
Right. Totally understand. Uh, if you plug a pedal into the controller, it will really depend on the controller. Most of them, uh, if you're plugging it in via USB or MIDI, really, uh, if the pedal attaches to the keyboard, it will transmit the appropriate MIDI data. I say that for most of them. It's not necessarily true for all of them. If you plug the pedal directly into the Kronos, you're guaranteed it will work. So if you're playing the piano keys, for example, on the other controller and holding down the damper pedal that's connected to the damper jack on Kronos, it will sustain. Uh, same is true for the expression and foot switch as well. Uh, someone wants to know if we have a Donkomatic on the other side of the room. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> we do have some very cool uh, Donkomatic sounds that you can download for the micro sampler, but uh, no, we currently don't have a Donkomatic in the office. Okay. Uh, no current questions. Uh, I was wondering, could you maybe talk about uh, some of the artist sounds that you guys have? Oh, uh, yeah. They were created with the artists in question. Can you talk at all about that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We, we had the great fortune um, of being able to, to sit down with some of our heroes while Kronos was being designed. So when you select a sound that is Herbie's Butterfly EP... Uh, it's called Herbie's Butterfly EP because we got to go to Herbie's house with a Kronos and customize this sound to his exact specifications. So the pedal that he selected, uh, the settings for the vibrato and, and uh, uh, excuse me, the tremolo and, oh yeah, vibrato and, and the speaker cabinet settings, the way that the uh, electric piano reacts, that's him. That's his work with us helping, uh, uh, helping to operate it and sculpt it the way he wanted it. So some other examples of that. I can give you would be uh, Lyle Mays of Pat Metheny Group. Uh, it was a wonderful experience uh, with Lyle Mays because he was very enamored with the piano sound but also with the reverb. So he wanted to crank the reverb all the way up knowing that not everybody would want this particular kind of piano sound but that it would be a great addition to what's already in there. And he sat exploring this reverb <laughs> Almost as though he was typing in notes and just letting them interact with the space. So it was wonderful to get that taste in there as well. Uh, Jordan Rudis helped us design a great Japanese grand piano sound in here. Um, yeah, we had we had a slew of our good friends helping us out. David Haynes is responsible for a lot of the stuff that you can uh, actually that you can download in the web shop, and he also helped us in our in the launch of the product as well. Um, we had some help from our friends, definitely. Uh, we had a question a little while ago. Uh, sorry, we didn't get to it earlier regarding uh, sample streaming. Um, you know, how does it work, uh, or you know, how how can it work for sounds other than just the basic preload stuff? You know, whether it be expansions you can purchase or. Um, we have uh, uh, the solid state drive is a big part of that. So when you purchase an EXS library or use the ten that are included with Kronos. Uh, what's happening is Kronos will load a small amount of data into RAM that allows it to access a large amount of data that's on the solid state hard drive. So, and you'll see that when you, when you operate uh, Kronos and load those EXS libraries, a small amount of RAM will disappear to load a multi-gigabyte library. And one of the cool things about that, uh, and the fact that the, one of the main benefits of the solid state hard drive, is that it can load uh, roughly a gigabyte's worth of samples in about 20 seconds. So that's an unheard of, very cool thing, and it's a big advantage of having the drive in there. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think that's it question-wise for the time being. Great. All right. Well, that's perfect, folks. Um, switch back to sign-off view. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming in, for asking us all these great questions, and uh, we hope to do this again soon. Oh, we got one quick question. Oh, all right. Okay, how do I set up a MIDI controller to actually move the knobs on the screen in program mode, like with the MS-20 GUI, for example? You would have to do that from the controller itself. If you're hooking up a class-compliant controller via USB, there is not a way to uh, assign the way Kronos reacts 
to that particular controller's assignments. So most MIDI controllers that have lots of knobs and faders allow you to assign what MIDI control change is being modified. So assuming you can do some system exclusive implementation as well, uh, you can access some of the parameters that are in Kronos that way. The short answer is you have to do it from the controller side. And one final question about <laughs> CX3. This is the last one. This Hit is me. coming from Poland. Uh, are the patches by default split for lower and higher manual control, and is there an easy way to manipulate drawbars? Absolutely, yeah. All right, let me go to a CX3 sound. Um, many of the, of the uh, programs that you play will actually have two sets of drawbars. So quickly switch over here. Here you can see both sets, and uh, if I pull the joystick down, here. If I pull the joystick down once, it's okay. Um, I have it split. So the uh, the split happens right there at middle C. If I pull the joystick down again, it switches to full upper mode. As far as an easy way to manipulate the drawbars, they're right there on the left side. So uh, anytime you want to manipulate the upper drawbars, that's very easy to do. With the preset, uh, with the lower manual, I'll show you how I do it. Um, you can assign them to the sliders if you want. You can do that in tone adjust mode, or you can just grab a slider on the screen and use the value slider right next to the display to, uh, to pull the flutes in and out. All right. I hope that ca uh, takes care of that. Um, again, thank you very much for joining us, guys. And uh, if you'd like to see the, uh, the previous live webcast, it should be available just below this video on the live stream page. And uh, that's about it. Thanks very much for joining us. We'll see you again next time.